Bob here, Chopper Bob Customs, and behind me are two really different vehicles. Over here we've got Bud's 39 Ford convertible that I've been doing the Carson top on. If you've been watching those videos, the, uh, there's 10 uh, parts to it so far. Uh, the top is over there now and we're going to put it on and so he can get it over and get it cleaned up for the uh, 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 Street Kings car show up in Guthrie tomorrow, Saturday. And, um, and then we'll be shooting live up there on uh, Chopper Bob Customs on Facebook. Diamond R Racing on Facebook because we're also going to have the blown retirement funny car there and uh, I'm also going to shoot some video and post it on YouTube uh, hopefully tomorrow maybe Sunday but uh, we'll get some shots of, of the car with the top on it and some other things going on there so check that video out um, and then when it gets back from the upholstery shop uh, I'll go over the car uh, to show you how it looks when it's all completed on another video. But these two cars, uh, like I said, this is Bud's 39 Ford. This car is my altered. It started out in the uh, late 60s, early 70s as a pile of tubes. Uh, it was welded together and run as a funny car when it was first assembled. Uh, then as years went by, it became obsolete for funny car racing and it was run as an altered uh, with small block Chevy bracket racing and when I became acquainted with the car it had a blown big block in it uh, running on alcohol and then I worked a deal with the owner uh, and uh, now it's mine and so I need to get it uh, need to get it running so I can take it racing because that's my plan here but this video is the long promised slow and coming Ackerman video and the reason I have these two cars behind me is because they have one very important component in common. Yes, a 39 Ford and a uh, 1970s, early 70s, late 60s funny car have one very important part in common. And that is the front spindles. Uh, both of these cars run the spindle that was designed for the 37 to 48 Fords. Um, the 39, I believe it has the original spindles. The 37 to 41 spindles are called round backs. And then the uh, 40, uh, 42 to 48 spindles are square backs. And I'll show you that in a minute on the round backs. I'm fairly certain that this car had round backs to start with. The backs have been cut off. Um, but there's enough of a curve on what was left and the spindle length is shorter like the round back spindles <coughs> I'm sorry the kingpins are shorter like the round back spindles had and when they went to the square back spindle they also increased the uh, the uh, kingpin length by about a half an inch so I'm fairly certain this is the 37 to uh, 41 uh, style spindles. They were probably original Henry's. Um, when I got the car, it did have Willwood or I'm sorry, it didn't have any brakes on it. They, they just ran it without uh, any brakes on the front. Uh, for that matter, when the previous owner got it, it still had drum brakes on the Dana 60 that's in the rear of it. He converted it over to disc brakes to be legal. And then I've gone ahead and put the Willwood uh, disc brakes on the front of it. Well, I'm in the process of doing that. But I've also noticed some issues that with the Ackerman that actually is a pretty common problem with these types of spindles when people put them on hot rods. And I'll go over that, go over a little bit of history of the history uh, of Ackerman, why it's called Ackerman, and what it actually does. And then I'll show you what I plan on doing on the, uh, on the altered here uh, to fix the problem a little bit and a little bit of my... Uh, thinking as to why I'm going the way I'm going with it. So with that, let me, uh, let me stop the video. I'm going to get the camcorder down a little bit low and I'll show you some stock spindles and I'll show you the uh, modified spindles on the altar, uh, handheld. So get your dram of me now. Be right back. Okay, so here we are underneath the 39 Ford and there's the back of the spindle. 
that obviously is the kingpin, or I don't, let's see, can I get in there? Uh, yeah, there is the end of the, um, the uh, I-beam axle, and that's the kingpin, and this is the front shackle, the transverse leaf spring, and behind it you can see the uh, I-beam axle. Uh, this has got been fitted with modern shocks, so there's the lower shock mount. Uh, here you can clearly see why they call them round backs, because the back, where the backing plate mounts to the spindle assembly, uh, is round. Uh, the square backs would definitely be a, well they're not really square, they're more of a rectangle, but uh, it would have a different shape than this. The bolt pattern is different. Um, and like I said, the kingpin is just a little bit longer. Uh, but on the other side, the side that the hub mounts on, uh, it, all, it is the same between the 37 to 41 round backs and the 42 to 48 square backs. So the hubs interchange, uh, but, the, but the backing plates and the steering arms and the kingpins are different. Um, so one of the things I want you to notice on this before we go over and look at the altered is this is what's called a rear steer. Uh, all of the steering linkage on this vehicle is behind the axle. There you can see the tie rod end going over to the steering box um, and then uh, on the other side you've got a tie rod end that comes over to the steering box. I, can I get in there to show you? Uh, I'm not sure whether you can see it or not but basically that's where the steering arm comes out of the box and attaches to the tie rod ends. Uh, I'm sorry, I take that back. On this car it attaches to the drag link and this tie rod actually runs from one side of the car to the other uh, connecting the front wheels. Okay, so let me pause this and we'll go take a look at the altered. So here we are at the altered and the first thing you'll probably notice is, is that it does not use a, an I-beam axle. It's got a round tube straight axle. Now you can uh, buy these dropped, you can buy them straight. Um, uh, my friend Sid uh, Droppel at Nostalgia Sids, he can take the I-beam axle like you saw on the Ford there and drop it to lower the front of the car without changing any of the suspension geometry. Uh, you do have to do a little bit of work with the uh, steering arms and so forth, but Sid can take care of you on that too. So if you want to lower an I-beam Ford, you need to get a hold of Nostalgia Sid. Talk to Sid Dropple, tell him that Chopper Bob sent you. But uh, here we've got, um, uh, like I said, I believe these are round backs based on some of the curvature I saw, but somebody has cut all of the round back off of it. And uh, the other reason I think it's a round back is this, the kingpin is a little bit short. So I believe it's a five and a half inch kingpin as opposed to the six. Um, but here you can see where they've cut the round back off. Here is where I had Steve at uh, More Power weld uh, some tabs on the front. And he's also welded one on the back so that the Willwood um, uh, caliper mount can bolt to the spindle and then I've got the Willwood uh, caliper. So uh, if you need exhaust work done, you need to talk to, uh, and you're in the Guthrie area, Steve at, uh, at More Power uh, Muffler up, on, uh, up in uh, Guthrie uh, does really good work. Uh, the 39's got uh, Steve's pipes on it and then the uh, 41 of mine has uh, mufflers and tailpipes from Steve. Uh, does very nice work highly recommend. At any rate, now the one thing about this is you'll notice that it is front steer and this is where we get into a problem with Ackerman and um, I'm going to go ahead and pause the video, sit down in front of the camera and go over a few things with you. In the early 1700s or mid 1700s, a gentleman by the name of Rasmus Darwin And if that name sound, sounds familiar, that's because Erasmus Darwin 
was Charles Darwin, the evolutionist's grandfather. Erasmus had some correspondence with James Watt, the inventor of the steam engine, uh, the guy that's the Watts of electricity are, are named after. Uh, and in that, he discussed the fact that uh, wagons were unstable, particularly when going around a corner uh, at any elevated speed. Uh, if you think about how wagons, horse-drawn wagons at the time were built, the rear axle was mounted solidly in the, in the frame of the wagon and had the wheels running on spindles on the back of it independently. And then the front, the axle was solid and had spindles on it just pretty much like the rear axle, only it had a pivot in the center of it so that the whole axle would turn uh, the, and it was hooked up to the horses and when the horses turned it would turn the axle and the wagon would would go that direction but the tighter the turn and the higher the speed the more likely the uh, wagon was to tip over and so uh, Erasmus um, uh, Darwin uh, developed a plan where the axle on the front was mounted rigidly and there were kingpins basically at the ends of it that had spindles mounted to it and then they had a tie rod mechanism that was attached to the horses. One of the issues that he realized early on was that when you're going around a corner you've got the car is making an imaginary circle if you will and somewhere out to the inside of the turn there is a pivot point that that circle is being drawn around and at the rear wheels um, that means that the inside wheel is making a, sh a smaller circle than the outside wheel uh, since they're both attached to the same vehicle they need to end up at the same place at the same time um, with spindles on a rigid axle on the rear each wheel can turn independently as it goes around the corner with a modern car with rear wheel drive uh, there had to be a way for the outer wheel to turn faster than the inner wheel because it had a longer distance to go in the same amount of time and that's where the differential came into being on the rear axle. Um, the, uh, and of course that was modified with limited slip, pause attraction, whoever, whatever brand you're talking about. And then the spool. This has a spool in it. So when I'm pushing it around in the pits and I go to make a turn, you can actually hear the tires scuffing because one of them has to slip in order to go around that corner. The, the same thing happens on the front end of the car if you think about it. The inside wheel is making a smaller circle than the outside wheel and so therefore it needs to have turned sharper than the outside wheel. And that's called toe out on turn or Ackerman. Now, like I said, it was originally, the concept was originally developed by Erasmus Darwin. Well, Erasmus never patented it and no one really paid much attention to it. Uh, about 50 years later, a German guy recognized the same problem and he independently developed Ackerman steering, toe in on turn, that type of front end that Erasmus Darwin originally created. And his name was George Lankensberger. I think I'm pronouncing that right. I could be wrong. But, but George uh, developed it, designed it, uh, and then he wanted to patent it in England. Well, he didn't want to go to England himself, and so he had his agent in England go patent it for him. And his agent went and had it patented under George Lankensberger's name, and so the patent was there, uh, it was in the either late 1700s, early 1800s, long before the automobile was developed. Uh, it was patented so that 
the car would tow out on turn. And um, the agent's name was uh, Ackerman, Rudolph Ackerman. And even though his name is not on the patent, uh, his name might, might be on the patent as, as the agent for George, uh, but basically it became known as Ackerman Steering. He had, had really nothing to do with the design of uh, Erasmus Darwin's or George Lankensperger, but his name got associated with it anyway. So, and here's a sketch of what I'm talking about. And if you have the center line of the rear axle and you have your front axle on pivots and ignore that one pivot floating around in space because that was a mistake on my part. But basically if you draw a line through the spindle to the center line of the rear axle and you draw it on the other wheel to the center line of the rear axle they should intersect on the center line of the rear axle and that's what I've shown here. Now whether or not that's accurate or not I don't know but that's what that's what basically Ackerman steering is and or tow out on turn because you think about it since this wheel has turned less severely and this wheel has turned more severely what has happened is it is actually towed out and the further you turn the more it tows out to make that the wheels follow different arcs because the inside wheel is following a smaller circle than the outside wheel. Okay, so that is in a nutshell what Ackerman is. Now, uh, that's a little bit hard to, uh, to set up and so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and draw in some um, uh, steering arms. A quick way to design Ackerman into a steering system is to take the pivot points of the front spindles and the pivot points of the tie rods and draw lines through them. And those should intersect on the center line of the rear axle. And that's basically the way this 39 Ford is set up. And if you notice, the arms bend away from the tire. Now if you think about it and all you do is you take this spindle over here and you put it over here and you take this spindle here and put it over here with these arms without being modified what now happens is the intersection point is somewhere out in front of the car and what this does is this creates toe in on turn which means that the outside wheel is turning sharper than the inside wheel and so what ends up happening is the tires scuff uh, if you hit something with one of the tires that doesn't have as much traction as the other the car will jerk uh, you'll get tire wear uh, there will be a lot of issues that uh, the tow in on turn are going to cause and that's what's happened on this car even though they've made the steering arms, what they did was they made them so that they resembled the stock 37 to 48 steering arms, but then since they're mounted on the front, you have this situation where you actually have tow in on turns, and that's actually what happens on this car, is it'll tow in on the turn. And so that needs to be fixed. Now, it gets a little bit more complicated than this because if you stop to think about it from the steering box from the steering wheel to the wheels on the car those are all pretty rigid metal parts if they're in good shape and they don't have a lot of rubber bushings and so forth in them when you turn the steering wheel you have a pretty good idea that this wheel is going to turn a certain amount but then you have two more components you have the roadway surface and you have the tires and those are a little bit uh, less rigid than the um, um, than all the steering mechanism uh, on the roadway surface the roadway can be dirt it can be gravel it can be cobblestone it can be brick 
It can be asphalt, it can be uh, concrete. Back in the old days when they used to run board tracks, it could actually be wood that you're driving on. And all of those surfaces have uh, different coefficients of friction. And when you think about the car making the turn, you're basically creating lateral acceleration. You're making the car go from being straight ahead to accelerating towards the center of the circle. And if you have a problem with coefficient of friction when you turn the wheels, if the uh, lateral acceleration exceeds the coefficient of friction, the tire is going to slide instead of the car going straight. Uh, it also makes a difference whether that surface is hot or cold, whether it's wet or dry. And then you get into the tires. The tires, the rubber compound can have different coefficients of friction. Uh, the tire construction itself, the, uh, the tread can have belts under it or can have not have belts under it. If it's got belts under it, they can be Kevlar, they can be steel. There's a lot of different types of materials that they can make the belts out of. What the belts do is they make the tread surface more rigid, which means that the, the tread is not gonna roll in the turn of cor in a turn it's going to be planted flatter on the surface which is going to give you better surface contact and then the actual sidewalls of the tire can be bias ply or radial ply it can be nylon it can be polyester and all these things function differently so between the tires and the roadway surfaces what you're going to have is called uh, a slip angle and you're going to have it on the rear wheels too because they're going to try and slip. And so what actually happens is when you're going around a corner you have this imaginary line in the center of the car that you think is going around the corner but what is actually happening is, is that since the tires have slid a little bit due to the lateral acceleration that circle now has a different radius than it would have had in an ideal situation and speed factors into it. The faster the car is going, uh, it changes the lateral acceleration, it changes the slip angle. So instead of having perfect Ackerman, which some people call zero Ackerman or 100% Ackerman or full Ackerman or just straight Ackerman, what you'll have is you'll have a modified Ackerman. And Detroit now has taken that into account and they've they have basically looked at how people drive the cars that they're designing. They look at what roadway surfaces that that customer is most likely going to be on. They look at the tires that that customer is most likely going to buy. And they figure that into a slip angle of the tires actually sliding while they're going around a corner. And usually a Detroit-based automobile will have 80% to 90% of the Ackerman that would be ideal. Um, and then when you get into race cars, you get into a whole different uh, design criteria. Uh, and if you go to the extreme, which I consider Formula One to be the extreme, uh, because Formula One is where money goes to die, uh, those guys will have basically on their tow vehicle, their trailer, or whatever, their support vehicle most probably, a whole myriad of different steering arms and other pieces that will basically change the Ackerman on the car to suit the track that they're driving on. Uh, and actually on some tracks, some cars will have anti-Ackerman or negative Ackerman tow in on turns like I've got on this altered right here. Uh, because they need a violent turn on the wheel and that outside wheel, since the weight is going to be shifted to it, they need it to react first and so they will actually have it tow in sharper than the inside wheel. And that might just be for one corner. They found that if they actually get it to tow in on that one corner, they can reduce their lap time on the entire course. And then uh, there are guys out there that are working on uh, 
having variable Ackerman, and they may already have it. I don't know. It's, uh, I don't. Uh, I don't claim to be a Formula One expert, but basically they want that initial sharp turn on the outside wheel, but then they want to go to uh, positive Ackerman or full Ackerman. Well, they probably don't go to full Ackerman because they're still going to have to deal with slip angle. But at any rate, so it's very, very complicated, Ackerman is. But what you'll see a lot of is guys driving on the street that have taken their I-beam axle and they've built a rat rod and they basically just flipped it all around because they want a suicide front end and they don't have room for steering behind the axle and so they've moved it to the front but they haven't done anything with the, with the steering arms on the spindles and so they wonder why their car handles like crap they wonder why they're wearing out their tires they're wondering why it's uncomfortable going around a corner particularly if there's a water puddle and all of a sudden they change lanes. And it can be fixed rather simply, particularly on this style of front end, by getting out the rosebud and heating the, uh, the steering arm and bending it and lengthening the tie rod. And on this one, because it does have uh, basically fabricated steering arms, I thought about cutting them off and uh, uh, and building new ones but there's been so much welding done on those spindles I thought about buying replacement spindles uh, but I came up with a little bit uh, less expensive and a little bit of a tunable solution I'm going to show you here let me start by telling you my reasoning behind the way I've gone with this design uh, this is a drag car it's not designed to go around corners it's got little pizza cutters on the front and it's got huge slicks on the back and it's designed to go straight down the track. Um, if you have to steer a drag car while you're going down the track, chances are most probably it's because the back end has gotten out of shape. One of the tires has either had more traction than the other or you didn't have them quite inflated correctly and that is basically pushing the car off the trajectory you want to be on. So my thought process is, is that I really don't want Ackerman. I want the tires, when I point them in a direction, I want them to be straightening the car up to drive it straight. And so what I'm going to shoot for here is no Ackerman. Uh, no toe in, no toe out. Um, I don't know whether that's what I really need to do, but my thinking on the process is that's what it needs to be. So what I'm going to do is, and let me flip this around here. Um, this is the steering arm, and I don't. You can see how it is pointing forward. Uh, well, it, it's pointing forward, but it's also pointing in, which is why I've got this um, anti-Ackerman problem where I'm towing in when I turn the wheel. And um, so what I've done is I've gone ahead. And uh, let me pull this tie rod off of here so that I can show you. What I've done is I've made a couple of quarter inch chrome molly plates that are going to bolt on the car. I'm going to go straight bolt on and the hole for the original tie rod end will be here. The hole for the new location will be about just a little over one inch. I think it's about one and a 30 seconds out here. And then I'll have a bolt back here to lock it in place. On the other side, it's got a steering stabilizer. So that uh, bolt will lock it in place on the back side of that. So, and what that'll do is that will move this out here so that if you draw a line through that pivot point, through the spindle, or through the uh, kingpin, uh, those lines are going to be very close to parallel, which means that the, that the tires are going to turn approximately the same amount when you're making them turn. Now I will have to build a longer tie rod. It's going to have to be right at about two and a sixteenth of an inch longer than this tie rod. I've got the tubing, I've got the, uh, the bungs to weld in the end, and of course the, uh, the heim joints and the nuts. I'll just simply reuse. 
But that is going to be my method of fixing this issue with this car. And uh, probably what I'll do in the future is show you the final installation. And then I will also let you know how it performs on the track once I get this car running and uh, take it out for some uh, test passes at uh, probably Thunder Valley down in Noble. Uh, I might go up to uh, Mid-America up in Arc City. Um, but that's where I'm at with my Ackerman on this. Uh, hopefully, uh, like I said, I am not a 100% expert on this. I know what it is. I know what it does. And um, uh, my hope is is that um, you, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, this gave you some insight as to what Ackerman is and what you need to do to make it work correctly on your car. Uh, just understand that even Detroit, it's a compromise. Uh, even in Formula One, it's a compromise. Um, and uh, the truth of the matter is, since you're going to be experiencing different driving conditions, you just need it to be close, but you do need it to be close. If you have set it up to where it toes in on turns and you're not driving Formula One, uh, you're going to have some handling issues, you're going to have some tire wear issues uh, that you really shouldn't have. And usually it's a pretty simple fix uh, to get it a lot closer than uh, what your modifications have taken it to. So if you got any comments, please put them in the comment section. Uh, uh, like I said, I'm learning about this right along with you guys. Uh, I've known about it for, for some time, but I've uh, the whole Formula One thing was new to me, and Erasmus Darwin was new to me when I started putting this video together. So, uh, if you got any comments, put them in the comment section. Please like this video. Uh, I'm making this, hopefully, so you guys will like it. And if you do like it, please click that like button. And tell your friends, if you got friends that uh, have a rat rod and it scares you to death, uh, let them know where you're at with the thing and uh, have them... Uh, Let's see about redesigning the front end and then uh, by all means subscribe uh, just smash that subscribe button and uh, I'm going to be having uh, like I said I'm going to have videos of uh, the um, uh, car show and swap meet tomorrow up in Guthrie Oklahoma and I'll be probably uh, putting together uh, my next video on working on cars uh, which may be some AC work, although that's going to be pretty mundane. Probably the next thing on working on cars will be installing floors and or installing a quarter panel repair section uh, that I think is going to be pretty interesting. And then I've got a potential engine swap that I'll be going over. I've got uh, the, uh, the altered that I'm going to be putting together. And then I've got a car that I'm going to be chopping the top and doing a whole lot of custom work to. So um, stay tuned, subscribe, tell your friends, because uh, we're going to be doing interesting things this year. Hey, thanks for watching, and Chopper Bob out.